there's nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We will control the horizontal. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. We will control the vertical. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Okay, that seems to be. Good. We're in. The kitchen sink is running. And here we are. And we're picking up where we left off, which was the very tail end of 1993. And you had just been recruited to sing and tour with Meatloaf. And that's exactly where we are. We are just about to go into your very first world tour. Tell us all about it. So I get the gig. I get the call on that Monday. And it's uh, funny because I, uh, we had tickets that night to go see Pat Benatar for her Gravity's Rainbow album. And I don't know, I think the tour... Another Pat. Yeah, another Pat. I, I, I adored her. You know, that album, Precious Time, I went crazy over that. And just all the, all of her songs. And so we had tickets that night. She was playing in the city. Uh, and of course, I just got the news that day. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching this concert from a completely different perspective because all I kept thinking to myself, my God, Patty, you're going to be doing this, you know, and looking around. And it was a small venue, but packed to the nines. And I'm going, this is going to be your life soon. It was surreal. A real kind of culture shock, I suppose. Yeah, because you're watching this, knowing that you're going to be on that side very, very soon. You know, this is what any artist dreams of. I mean, what a what a first gig to get. Number one album, number one song, soon to be. It was crazy. Yeah, and that was, uh, that was I Would Do Anything For Love, yeah. right? Yeah. And so tell us about that time and about going from the audition, having got the gig, through to packing your bags and going on tour. Yeah. We were rehearsing in the same place that I had auditioned, which was uh, Montana Studios. So yeah, hi ho, hi ho. It's off to rehearsals I go. So this was my daily, daily work schedule. Do you remember which songs from Bat Two you rehearsed? Um, I don't know what it is, but it, oh, just won't quit. Everything louder. Life is a lemon. Um, rock and roll dreams come through. Some of those songs take me right back to the early 90s and uh, a very specific point in time um, especially it just won't quit I always remember there was this girl who I used to see on the bus after school funnily enough her name was Sarah Connor like Linda Hamilton's character from from Terminator I was gonna say Total Recall but Terminator yes <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah just like just like just like Linda Hamilton's character from Total Recall exactly and uh, and Waldo. Um, <laughs> Forgive me, I, I totally made you lose your train of thought there. That's okay. That song just won't quit brings you back. Yeah, you but. can't you you can't dismiss the power that music has, especially if it's a song that you haven't heard for a long time and maybe you'll just catch it on the radio or at a friend's house or whatever and you'll hear it. It was powerful to perform. To me it sounded like it had started mid song. The dialogue, you know, it's like starts as if the conversation had already begun yeah it's one of the the great tools of storytelling you always jump in at the last possible moment we did a lot of a lot of songs from that album actually so when we're in the studio everybody's working out different parts and and steve is uh you know dictating as as the uh songs are coming together and what's going to go where and it was an interesting time because it really was from the ground up for me for everybody because it's a new tour new songs i'm trying to remember how how long we were into rehearsals before steve comes over to me and uh, kind of takes me outside he goes can i talk to you for a minute i'm trying to figure out how to say this to you and he said i actually spoke with my wife to help me to have to say this to you. And, and I'm like looking at him like, what, what is he talking about? And he's like, look, I'm only the messenger here, but 
can you start coming to rehearsals dressed a bit more feminine? More feminine. More feminine, yeah. I never expected something like that to come out of his mouth. And it was, it's, it was just such a weird, such a strange thing to say because we're in rehearsals and it's not like I'm, this is not what I'm gonna be obviously gonna be wearing on stage when we're performing. Basically, people are wearing jeans and a t-shirt, right? Yeah, and some were in like, you know, shorts, a tank top and flip-flops. And I was like, uh, yeah, uh, okay, like what do you, do you want me to come in, in like dresses? Should I be coming in, coming in in stage clothes? Okay, what does this have to do with the music? But all right, then that became every evening planning what am I going to wear uh, and, and going in there. It's like, is this okay? Uh, is that okay? I don't know. I don't know what else to, how else to, descri- I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, an odd request to make considering everyone else is really just wearing the casual clothes, right? I didn't go in there in painter's clothes or like I was working underneath a, in a car, but <laughs> it was very strange. Where do you go with that? I had no idea. But okay, so there I go, preparing outfits the night before. I guess you could say from that moment on, I was definitely uh, very dressed for rehearsals. Anyway, onwards and upwards, because right now things are, you know, really starting to amp up here. And there's a lot going on. There's obviously what's going to be this massive tour coming up. And of course, I don't have anything to base that on, but just from the activity of, you know, people coming in and out. And then, the, you know, as, as we're progressing with rehearsals, now we've got a uh, front of house guy who's set up outside because there's no space in the rehearsal room for his board. So there's a, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Things are happening and again, all new to me. So eventually we got our parts all lined up and all of that. And I think Meat was coming in periodically and we start actually running through set lists and so we're going through things everything's sounding really great and we'd get to paradise and we never ran paradise in its entirety in rehearsal ever the first time i did a full run through of paradise was in front of an audience one of these family and friends things that a lot of artists do they'll once they've have everything set up They'll put together a venue. Wow, so you, you actually never rehearsed the whole song during rehearsals. I'm guessing, I'm not going to put words into your mouth, but I'm guessing you only got up to the play-by-play. Well, yeah, that was it. You know, going to go all the way tonight. And then we... then we, And then you never did. Then we, then we never did. Then we went to, <laughs> you know, we'd start back up on stop right there. So stop, you know, stop right there became the start back. I can remember even once as, as the music is going and he didn't cut it off. Um, so uh, like I approached him and was just like, okay, so what are we, and he's like, ah, oh, no, 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 don't worry about that. And then we just, all right, then he'd cut the band and we'd go, but we never ran the song. And it was, I'll tell you, it, it definitely, uh, it played with you because it was like, okay, what am I, what's going to happen here? You know, I, I mean, I saw the videos with Carla, um, which I didn't know was actually Ellen Foley's voice. But uh, anyway. For those who don't know, live Paradise by the Dashboard Light has the sports play-by-play section where both the boy and the girl characters make out, going first, second, kind of third base kind of territory. And that happens live, and it's acted out as if you were watching theatre. Um, which a lot of people, even to this day, still struggle with the line between um, understanding the line between rock and roll and theatre. But that's the genre that that Meatloaf and Jim's music is in. Exactly. Exactly. It was. I mean, each, each of these songs are bits of theatre. Exactly. Um, and so not to stray from the point, but you never got to rehearse the play-by-play which is crazy. Never. And, you know, I'm the new kid on the block here. I'm not going to sit there and start questioning. I, I did, you know, reach out to a few people about it, but it was one of those things where, okay, and we literally, the first time we ever did it, 
was in front of an audience. And I'm just, you know, looking off to my, to my left and going, okay, this was happening in real time. So I did not know what to expect. You know, and he's like taking off my jacket and I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm in front of an audience. Where am I gonna go with this? I've just gotta go, I'm going along with it as best as I can. And it was a trip. It's crazy because because from the audience's perspective, you look at something like that and you just imagine that it's so choreographed and so rehearsed to death. Well, eventually, it, 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 eventually it came into that as you get to know somebody. But man, going in completely cold on that. I steamed through that one. And uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm just thankful that... Uh, well, we got through it and on to the next. I mean, you know, shortly after that, we were doing a bunch of uh, small clubs uh, in the States. I think we did a quite a few dates in a row. It was either the Hudson Theater or the Beacon. Preparing, getting ready. Uh, we were flying. Oh, God, what happened that one time? I flew, like, out of the blue. Not out of the blue, but there was promo because we were getting ready uh after a few months to, to head up down to uh, Australia and promos starting. So now I'm getting introduced to doing promo. And he flew myself and Chasm over to Australia. And, and I wasn't a great flyer to begin with prior to this. And that was one thing that like loomed over my head. I go, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do all of this freaking flying? Oh, tell me about it. I always, uh, I always close uh, my eyes and hope for the best. You know, it's like Aretha Franklin. I think she used to take boats or didn't go, <laughs> stopped going. Same with Stanley Kubrick, apparently. So I'm like, ugh. Yeah, bad flyer. Never wanted to fly. Exactly. We're doing a quick turnaround. I think it was less than a week to Australia and back to do a television show. And I'm one in the beginning. I used to sit because it's the turbulence. You know, that's, that's it. So that's the part that, that freaks anybody out. And I looked like Stevie Wonder, you know, when Stevie Wonder's playing and he's just <laughs> rocking back and forth. I mean, once the turbulence started, that was me in, in, in a... Uh... Always reminds me of that episode of The Twilight Zone with William Shatner, if you remember that one. Oh, I don't know, remember. I uh, saw that, that one. That was the, the infamous plane flight episode with the, the weird monkey demon on the wing of the plane. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, well, that's... Well, that's the only thing that uh, that was missing from that because I was freaking out. <laughs> you know, and I'd be down. Definitely, I definitely had copious amounts of uh, copious cocktails before those uh, before that flight. Um, Sounds like a but, band. Uh, even still, so it was just Chasm and I. No, I meant the name Copious Cocktails. <laughs> oh. oh, sorry about that. Uh, again, all new. This is all. This is the way it's done. This is the way. And you, you had a lot of costume changes on that tour. I did. I did, yeah. And wig changes as well. And you had wigs. Yes, yes. Many wigs. Yes. Well, no, I had uh, I had the one wig. Uh, and as my hair was growing out, uh, I would kind of change that up. Uh, because I think we started with Anything for Love. So then I could, I had some time to, you know, tease the shit out of it and spray it to no end. And then back to uh, Paradise. Uh, with the with the blonde wig. Ah, so then we're off and now we're doing big promo, I think, right before we headed to Australia. We did uh, Leno, Jay Leno. Jay Leno, tell us about that. Tell us how it was meeting Jay Leno and appearing on the show for the first time. There's a funny story there. Um, you're backstage there at, uh, at is, what, is NBC? I think it's NBC. And... There's the band room. I have a dressing room. And Pat Thrall needed to use a phone. And either there wasn't one in the room they were in or it wasn't working. So Pat's like, do you mind? Can I, can I use your phone? I was like, no, go. So I, you know, I walk out of the room to give him his privacy, of course. And uh, on the other end of the door, I guess, because Jay Leno goes and wants to introduce himself to everybody and meet, and meet everybody. So... And cause obviously Pat tells this story because I wasn't there. And he gets a knock on the door and he's thinking it's me. So Pat goes like, who is it? And his friggin' Jay Leno. I mean, and Pat says he was just like <laughs> mortified. He's just, Cause he thought it was me knocking on the door. Very funny. Uh, as a side note, Pat Thrall, best guitarist that band ever had. 
He had the look, he had the presence, and he had yeah. the chops and the yeah. sound. Great guy. Uh, he was missed from the... When he left the band, he was missed, I think, from an audience perspective. You no, know, he went off. I mean, he started um, started with, I think, Pro Tools and, and learning. Uh, it was becoming... He wanted to get more and more involved in the recording aspect of the business. And I can remember, man, I mean, he was diligent. You know, he'd be on that bus and he had these manuals that looked, I mean, they looked like New York phone books. And he was just beginning to learn about all of this new type of recording. You know, the computers were just, we were just starting to get uh, laptops. Well, I'm an, I'm an old school guy. I still prefer the old Neve desks and analog recording. But I appreciate Pro Tools for what it was at the time, a technological innovation that allowed artists to record on the fly and to fix things on the fly. Uh, did you know that Pat went on? You probably know this, obviously. Pat went on um, probably just after he left the band around 97, 98. Uh, I'm imagining he went on to record an album with Joe oh, Satriani. He did. Oh, did you know? many, many pro projects. I mean, he worked with, uh, he was mixing and fixing stuff with like uh, Beyonce. Um, and huge, huge projects. This was Joe Satriani's Engines of Creation, um, which was kind of an experimental album for Joe, uh, incorporating for the first time some slightly more dance-like rhythms into what's usually instrumental hard rock. Uh, but I'd, I'd grown up in my teens as a, as a massive Joe Satriani fan, and that was thanks to my uncle, uh, who was a guitarist at the time. And How cool is that? Yeah, and, and, and that rubbed off on me in a, in a huge way, because I, I picked up a guitar because of my uncle, uh, Dean Cutler. And now, if we skip ahead all this time in the future, uh, every now and again, you know, every every three years or so, we will still meet up and we will still go and see Joe Satriani in concert when he's in town. Oh, that's cool. But now my uncle is a guitar luthier and he's just about to launch his own company of Cutler Custom Guitars. How did you describe him? He's a, he's a, he's a what? Uh, a guitar luthier, uh, a guy who makes musical instruments. He makes guitars and he makes, in my opinion, not just because he's related to me, but because I, I didn't know there was an actual word for that. Yeah, there you go. Uh, he makes he makes some great great guitars. He hasn't really launched his company yet, but when he does, you're gonna have to put that out there at, on on the kitchen sink. Because his I was blown away because I've you know guitar is a hobby for me. I'm not a musician, but I I like to screw around with guitars whenever I can. Um, it's a great creative release for me that isn't sitting down writing things, and. Um, I wish I had the patience to learn. I've been fortunate enough to play a lot of great guitars, um, like Sir Guitars and some of the some of the custom shop stuff. And uh, astoundingly, Dean's guitars actually measure up to those guitars, and I was blown away. Um, the work he does, he puts so much, so much time and so much attention to detail in it. And I guess because he's been a guitar player all of his life. He really gets it. And, uh, yeah, for me, it was this has turned into an infomercial. We've got to get him on here. He's got to get moving. Get those guitars. Get them going. I think it would be a, a cool thing, especially because I haven't really caught up with him for a while because he's been so focused on making this business real that he's just locked away making guitars and making super strats. Good for him. Uh, he's going through that whole Eddie Van Halen 1978 kind of kind of uh, souped up Stratocaster phase at the minute and he's really just trying to concentrate on not only the tones through pickups but wow. but the the way that the guitars are finished and the tone woods that he's using to try and capture those kind of sounds and that kind of feel when you're playing well you're going to have to get him on there I'm saying now get him on there and we're going to have to get uh... I know he's been filming some little sections uh, just for his own his own log uh, at home from the beginning of production on these things. I mean, he started doing this over a year ago and he still isn't ready to launch. He's a perfectionist. So follow your dreams, follow it through, see it through. 
That's it. So put the calls in. Light, the, light those fires. He always wanted to do something with music. Uh, he made a great demo tape in the mid-90s. Um, fantastic playing. I will send you some of those tracks. They're amazing. Um, but then he got kind of caught up in the world of business and never went back to it. And only recently has he looked back at his life and how he's hit a certain age. And he said, why didn't I do that? And yeah. uh, Never too late. Never too late. We had this conversation and uh, he decided to do it. Anyway, back to back to life on the road. Oh no, I was telling you that. Yeah, well, well, Pat, you know, with yeah, with Leno knocking on the door. I mean, that was hysterical, and the way Pat described it, because it, Pat's also very animated, and I, we were just rolling. We just freaking lost it. So, from then, when we were doing Leno, because we were already on the West Coast, that was it. Off to uh, Australia again, and. Uh, I don't know if it was on that particular flight. Uh, and I'd have to look back to see if we went back there while Pat was still in the band. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, true story. And this one's good. This one was, it was, it was a holy shit moment. So, uh, so we're on a Qantas flight and we're flying off and it's late in the evening and uh, Pat and I were pretty much the last one standing and he and I could just, uh, American term, talk the tits off a bull. So we're just chatting away and the cocktails are flowing and, uh, you know, the plane, the lights are down. Uh, most people are sleeping or at least trying to sleep. Um, and the stewardess comes up to us and she's like, uh, excuse me, uh, the, uh, the pilot would like to invite you both to the cockpit. And we just like looked at each other, you know, we were like, yeah. So, you know, with drinks in hand, the, he and I go off into the cockpit. So we're sitting in like the jump seat and then there's another seat up there. So you've got the pilot and the co-pilot and, you know, we've already had quite a few cocktails and so we're, and we're loud and, and we just start chatting up a storm with the, with the pilot. I start going into, I think I was singing Mala Femme and I start singing Italian songs. Maybe it was Italian, I don't know. But it was hilarious. Here we are with the pilot and the co-pilot and then the pilot, this is unbelievable. The pilot asks me, he's like, would you like to fly this plane? And I'm kind of like, what? He's like, do you want to fly? Do you want, would you like to fly the plane? And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. And son of a bitch. <laughs> and can I just truly... say, folks, that's how you get over your fear of flying. Lots of alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. So he gets up out of this seat. And there goes little old me sitting down with my co-pilot. Um, and he was, uh, he's like, okay, you know, at the moment we're in uh, autopilot. And he's like, you're getting comfortable and all of that. And I'm just sitting there. I still cannot believe this is happening. And he takes, he's like, okay, I'm going to, to it's on autopilot. And he's like, I'm just going to, you know, take it off of autopilot now. So I'm in now, I'm, yeah, my heart's like, da, 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 And he takes it off of autopilot. And I'm holding on to the steering and... Just ever so slightly, you start to feel the plane just going just uh, to, off to the left a bit. And I am just freaking at it, it. It was an incredible, incredible experience. And I was like, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do over here. <laughs> and I can't even imagine. This is a commercial flight. Imagine all the 300 passengers back there. I was about to say, I can't imagine how it actually would have felt the weight of the plane shifting like that. And in the back of your mind, you have all of the people sat down behind you. Everybody fall, everybody asleep, has having no idea that, you know, I mean, I've had a few cocktails. I mean, like, like I'm saying, you know, I mean, we're in business class or first class or whatever. All those people who, who weren't aware that a drunken Paddy Russo was flying the plane. Pretty much flying Flying your way up. Thank you for flying Qantas Airlines. True story. I mean, you can ask Pat. Uh, and it was it was 
unbelievable, uh, a, a crazy moment. That, of course, in this day and age, would never happen. But uh, quick aside, what's Pat doing these days? Man, you know, I would imagine, of course, they've got to be still in Vegas now because they moved over there. Zoe, his wife, she was running the power station in New York, and oh, wow. uh, the Palms, yeah, the Palms Casino in Las Vegas wooed her over there because they, you know, they had the huge recording studio there. You know, I, I would love to talk to Pat sometime just about guitar and tone. I haven't spoken to him in ages, so a, a call is definitely overdue. And I will try to do that for you and see if you guys can have a chat and all of that. That would be amazing. I would love to do that. He's funny. I love him. Boy, I talk about timing. So they're out there in Vegas. And subsequently, uh, I believe I was doing We Will Rock You at the time. Pat had a project coming together. And Pat calls me up and it's like, listen, uh, I'm doing this project. They need someone to sound like Peggy Lee. Uh, you'll be doing the song, uh, Why Don't You Do Right? And I was like, sure. And it was a project for Sony. This particular recording was going to be part of a film like a pre preamble is that the right word to the video for this uh, the artist known as the dream featuring another artist known as ti so i i went in and it was uh i tried to capture the essence and, well basically trying to cop Peggy Lee's vocals as best as I could. And so I am in this video. Well, you know, I'm not in the video. My voice is to one of the Victoria's Secret models named Salita Eubanks. And she did a lousy job lip syncing. I'm a beautiful girl, but she did a terrible job <laughs> lip syncing. It's like she should have worked a little harder on that. But I guess the eye candy, the eye candy was more important than... Uh, Sinking. So I've never heard this. Yeah, I've I've never heard this, and I've never seen the video. You're gonna have to send me that one. I'll send you the link. Yeah, I'll send you the link. It's cute. I mean, it's cute. The song is called "The Makeup Bag," and the message is basically the if you're cheating on your girl, you know, uh, put five stacks on a makeup bag. So spend five grand and get her a purse, and that's gonna make everything go away. So not a great message. Yeah, uh, you've got to wonder about the yeah. morality of that one, haven't you? <laughs> mm, I know. Well, I'm in the beginning. I'm not in the in the actual song. Right. So, I w I was just, but it was yeah, it was cool, 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 cool. Just like uh, doing the the Grinch story behind that. I'm singing one of the songs in the Jim Carrey's The Grinch. And it's during the scene where this one, one woman is shooting Christmas lights on the roof of her home. And you'll hear me in the background singing the song called Perfect Christmas Night, which I recorded in a closet. I recorded that demo in midnight. This is with Paul O'Neill. May he rest in peace. And... What's his partner's name? God, that's terrible, Patty. You know, I, I didn't interrupt you there because I didn't want to interrupt your flow. But I only, and it took me a moment to remember this, but it was only on the edge, the very edge of my recollection, that you did a song uh, for the Jim Carrey film The Grinch. Uh, when you just said that a moment ago, I was in my head. I'm going, what really? Did you did you really do that? Um, and then I remembered. Uh, I I'm going to have to go back and listen to that as well. They called it the Whoville medley, and they attached some heavy music, and it was like da na 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 Grinch da na 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 na, and then they attached. Perfect, which the two were completely different genres of music. <laughs> right. But they put it together. And I was, I was doing Notre Dame. I was doing the, the show in England. And in fact, I was flying out the next day 
that evening at about midnight, we, when we finally got to recording, I recorded in a paper closet in their office in the city. And that demo, it, it was fun. There was some ad libs that I did there because when they modulated, I, you know, I was like, bring it up, boys. <laughs> so, and then just added some little things at the end. They're very colorful. So, I, and off I went back home and flew to England and boom, boom, boom. This made the cut, but I wasn't listed. The credits on the album were Trans-Siberian Orchestra, whom I never performed with. I mean, I did their, I did Beethoven's Last Night, that concept album, and my name appeared there. But for the Grinch project, I was, I was like, hey, you know, do you want to put my name in there, guys? Come on. Who are the guitarists from? the Trans-Siberian Orchestra? Uh, Al Petrelli is, is one. Aha, yeah. uh-huh, you said it. You said it. Now, I, it was on the tip of my tongue, and you know what? One of the first guitarists I ever saw um, as a kid that made an impression on me was Al Petrelli. And it was on VHS, and at the time, and I think it was, I think he was only in the band for one tour, or one album, one tour cycle. I don't think he played on the album. Uh, this was mm-hmm. Alice Cooper, and it was the Trash is the World tour. And during that VHS, which I must have played uh, as a kid, you know, in my early teens, maybe 13 years old, 14 years old, right, right through to being kind of 16, 17, I must have played that hundreds of times. And there's this one moment where Al Petrelli has a solo spot and there's just something about his tone and his playing that really captured my imagination back then. He's a great guy. I mean, he's a great musician, but he's also a great, you know, a great person. The last time I saw him uh, when Paul O'Neill suddenly passed, that Mm. was really was a shock. So sad. So sad. I mean, what a great, great person. I cannot tell you uh, the things that he's done for me. Uh, you know, personally, just absolutely in- incredible. And he adored when, when he had his daughter. Um, he couldn't stop talking about his daughter, Ireland. Every time I saw him, every, every time we spoke, it was just, you're not gonna believe this. You're not, not gonna believe what she's doing now. And oh, Patty, can you hear her? And then I think sometimes he had her on the phone. Absolutely incredible. Oh my God, here's a crazy story, a quick one. So G- Jim Steinman reaches out to me. He wanted to. He's like, can uh, can you get me in touch with with Paul? I need. I, I have an idea for something, and I want to run it by him. So I send. I send Jim. To, Paul Crook's information and Jim wrote back no he's like no Paul O'Neill lol and I was like oh sorry <laughs> uh oops wrong Paul wrong Paul god I wonder what what that project would have been or could have been and if they did speak yeah they did speak I never I don't think I ever followed through That's, that that one's news to me I mean and Paul O'Neill was a huge huge Simon fan I I mean he even, to me, he dressed like Steinman. I can see that. With the glasses and the yeah, leather. Absolutely. He, he had that look. I was like, wow. You know, the gloves, the whole, the whole nine yards. I remember going to CTSO. I believe it was Chicago. I want to say it was the Fox Theater. I don't know why, but when TSO was just starting out. So they're doing this small theater. And the whole concept of the Christmas shows, which have since then blew up. And I was in Nashville and they happened to be playing. And this is, this is what Paul O'Neill does. Sends a limousine to come and get me. Oh no, he wanted to send a a limousine. And I was like, no, I'll get a cab over there. Or did he send a limousine? I don't remember. (laughs) Maybe one going back. I don't know. (laughs) Well, at least, at least you had the idea of being humble anyway. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's like, all right, Patty. Um, but carte blanche, the whole 
the whole evening, everything. What the, the introductions, this one, that one, meeting this one, um, and sent me home with a ton of swag. I mean, there were books. Give these to children. Give this uh, so so much, so many things. My my hands were were full. And you know, he used to another side story that most may not know. After the project started blowing up and blowing up, and they were doing these great, you know, arenas like just selling out, they would have the the band and the the artists go out because this is during the holidays, and just hand them wads of money, and just go out in the street, and if you see somebody down and out, just give them money. And Paul would love to do that. And on more than one occasion, he's given like thousands. He'd be with his daughter, Ireland. I remember that story. Saw a guy down and out, and he's, and he's like pulled over. Oh, what a beautiful thing for a daughter to say. And yeah. I think he gave him like, you know, a couple of grand. That's amazing. I mean, that, yeah, that yeah. can be life-changing in, in, in yes, certain situations. Yes. And he carried that out as, as the project grew which is Fantastic. proof positive that paying things forward you know none of none, things like this that's how the universe works you know you you help that's what we're here for to be of service to others to our fellow man exactly and 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 sadly we had to lose that one but I, i'm sure they're carrying that on i'm certain of it if they ever get everybody back at, up and running and start oh, these shows again. Hard when you lose the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. He was definitely a good one. But uh, where did we start? What was I originally talking about? Because I, I do no have a idea. tendency. I thought we were talking about the, the project, the, the dream, uh, the makeup bag song. And then I jumped into TSO because of the Grinch. And then I jumped into Paul, and then we'll wrap that one up. Okay, so reel me in. Yeah, where are we? Where, who are we? Where, where what, are we? Yeah. What's my name again? I saw the whole thing. What happened? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm Patty Who. So wrap it up. So now, exactly. Patty Who. Cindy Who. Oh, Patty Who. Cindy Who from, uh, from The Grinch. Speaking, uh, speaking of names, yeah. when you first joined the band, if I recall correctly, you went under the name Patricia Rousseau. And then you changed it suddenly to Patty Russo, which is who everyone knows today. I'm curious, why? why what prompted the change in the first place? <clears throat> mm, well, actually, Meat uh, had asked me if I would consider changing my name. Oh, wow. So, so it was a request. Yes. And he actually wanted a, uh, one of the suggestions for a name change was Rita Fox. Rita Fox? Rita Fox. Can we have a moment of, a respected moment of silence for poor, unborn Rita Fox? Again, I've just joined the band. You know, the new kid on the block over here. You know, I had to sit with this one for a bit. Yeah, because it's not like you're changing your entire identity. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, Rita Fox, and I'm like, mm. Did you ever get an explanation as to why they wanted you to change your name. I mean, did they think it would play better for an audience? I, honestly, I can't remember. Honestly, I, I don't remember why. But I, you know, he definitely, you know, wanted me to consider that. What a strange alternate timeline that would have been, huh? Yeah, Rita Fox. So. If, if, if we were sitting here today and I was calling you Rita, you sound like some kind of character from the A-Team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eventually I asked him if I could... Uh, just change my name. Can I just be Patty Russo? And he was like, yeah, fine. But it was weird because I have, I have all these, well, quite a few plaques that have the, the names, you know, Patricia Russo. Some are, they're all spelled. Uh, one is spelled correctly. I think there's a couple of them that, uh, it just, it was confusing. I mean, I was sign autographs and just, you know, forget. And I was like, oh, fuck, you know. I don't remember why. He asked me to change my name, but... Um, but he did, and eventually 
you you returned to Paddy Russo, the Paddy Russo that everyone knows. Okay, so you're on tour. Everything's going well. You're getting to see places you've never seen before. What's it like? Describe it to people. Tell us what tell us what happened. So onwards and upwards. Let's see where were we? Um, what happened after that? So that was the whole Leno. Now we're already on the west coast. So the next next stop is uh, Australia. Oh, the land down under. Yeah, what a flight! And just having to do that because not that long before. I had just done that quick turnaround with Chasm. And so here I go again, boom. And that is a long ass flight, very long flight. And which, from the lab, last, oh, excuse me, from the lab, from the lab, <laughs> I'm thinking of fucking COVID, from the last, po- <laughs> last podcast, the like a little cliffhanger was that uh, this was the tour for me that almost never was. So I guess uh, I'll get into that right now. The tour that nearly broke Patty's back, uh, mm-hmm. metaphorically and otherwise. Yeah, that was a that was that was a hard one. That was what should have been the most exciting time of my life turned out to be anything but yeah i mean you're this is you you you've entered the band you've done rehearsals and um it's your first ever world tour with uh with an enormous act i'm officially on tour all those other bits in between when we were doing promo uh we were doing dates in new york and uh, periodic things and, and television but this was officially, I am officially on tour. And we get down to Sydney. And I think we had already d- even done, before we started doing the shows, we did the Sydney's barbecue. I remember that, because Steve Miller Band was playing there. So, um, but that was just a one-off. That was a big festival with a bunch of artists. So now we're coming to our dates. And getting our shows ready and my boyfriend flies down and surprise I had no idea he was coming so he's there to surprise me and what you know flying all the way from New York to Australia I was I was a shocker to see him I was like oh my god I can't believe you're here so we're all hanging out this one evening in the bar and he had gone up he was tired obviously jet lagged and a few of us, or a couple of us, were still down in the bar. And the tour manager comes, comes down and was like, uh, we got a problem here. Your boyfriend, needs, uh, your boyfriend needs to leave. He needs to leave Australia or you don't have a gig. That can't have gone down well. <laughs> and it was just very da 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 Gotta go. Did they did they give you a reason why at the time? What a strange request. It, he was only the messenger. That was it. But sure. it was the I can't even tell you. I can't even remember how I felt at that moment. I was just like kind of shaking my head and going, what? I, it, none of it made any sense. I was like, my boyfriend has to leave. What the hell are you talking about? My boyfriend has to leave. What happened? We just got here. And yeah, it's not like he's this guy making a nuisance of himself or or intruding on on the band space, etc., right? He's just he's just there in the hotel room to support you. He just got there. <laughs> it's like <laughs> he stepped off the plane. I, I, well, it, uh, close enough. Close enough. But it was insane and, and I just didn't know and he didn't have anything else really to tell me. That's it. So, and off he left. Or did he stay? I don't remember the whole... I know I left. I know. It was like, boom. I was just in a, in shock when I had gone up to the room. And I was like, you're not going to fucking believe this. I just... Uh, I've just been told that you need to leave the country. Or I don't have a gig. And... 
So let's so let's get this straight. So let's get this straight. Your your boyfriend turns up to support you on the tour, and no sooner has he arrived that your tour manager is asking to speak with you privately, uh, and he's giving you. No, he didn't speak to me privately. It wasn't private at all. It was just to. to I think there was a couple of us down there. Um, no, this was to whoever was there. This wasn't oh. pulling me aside. This was just kind of okay. coming down and black. And he's giving you this ultimatum that uh, your your boyfriend has to leave the country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm trying to think if it was like, if he said like 48 hours. I wonder if he even gave hours. If it was 48 hours, 24 hours. I want to say, I don't, re, yeah, I, I, I want to say there were, there was a timeline involved, but can't quote me on that because I think. So this is. I was just in shock. So this is not just a request that your boyfriend find another hotel to stay in. Um, oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is, this is a. An ultimatum, in a way. Yeah, here's your heart. What's your hurry? Uh, I, telling him to leave the country. That's the bit that, because I know we obviously, we obviously, we've we've talked about this many times before. Mm-hmm. But for the sake of other people, trying to clarify that situation so they can understand, it's a hard thing to communicate. Just the the shock of it, the idea that this is your first world tour, your partner is there to support you, and no sooner has he arrived than he's told to actually get back on a plane and and leave Australia altogether uh, with no reason. That's pretty much how it happened. So I get hit with that, and I was just... I didn't know what to say to any of that. None of that made sense. And when I had gone upstairs, I was just... And I said that to him, and I was like, you know, I go, I don't, I don't think this isn't for me. This isn't for me. This is crazy. I don't like how this feels. Um, I, I don't want to do this. And he was like, no, no, no. Listen, listen. Don't worry. Um, obviously, I'm not leaving. I just got here. He's like, but I'll go. I'll go traveling around. He's like, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I mean, this is this is Australia. And he and and he did. He went and took a ride. Got a car and drove up the east coast of Australia. And funny enough, he ran into the wardrobe uh, person's boyfriend who also had flown in to hang out with her and see Australia. And they ended up traveling together and staying together because... uh, my guy, he got a hotel room. He had two beds, and the wardrobe's boyfriend was staying in hostels. And my guy was like, what, what, what are you staying in a hostel? He's like, staying in a hostel, you got to share a bathroom with strangers. Get out of here. He's like, get out of here. And he's like, stay with me. And they, they ended up traveling together. Uh, wow. Yeah. And then... Uh, <clears throat> and then, dun dun dun, he came back. So, eventually came back. And this is another weird one. But we're getting ready to do a show this evening. We're all in catering. And obviously, they're aware that he's back. Even though he wasn't, <clears throat> he, he wasn't at the venue and he didn't come and see the show. But uh, that evening in catering, pre-show, the guitar tech, his, it was his birthday, around the time of his birthday, and they got, they were getting him, and they got him a stripper. So, Meat makes an announcement to everybody in catering to, you know, I want everybody okay? <clears throat> I need everybody to gather around, what have you. So I go grab a chair. I figure this is this is gonna be like showtime. Uh, the stripper's coming out, so I get a chair pretty close to me, uh, in front of him. And he, when he gets everybody's attention, 
he makes an announcement that he basically said, well, most of you know that Patty's boyfriend was asked to leave the country and he didn't and he's back here in Sydney. So if any of you see him, uh, you need to contact management or something along those lines. That's crazy. Uh, what was running through your mind when you hear this? When you're, you're standing there, there's a room full of people. You're people expecting... that I don't know. There's all new people there. I mean, it's not. It's bad enough. I mean, I've known the band because I've been in the band since June. Uh, and this is now the end of October. But all of these strangers, promoters, record company people, uh, caterers. Uh, uh, I wanted to crawl under a rock. And it was... What a, well, I mean, from an outsider's perspective, what a crazy response or reaction. Yeah. Um, Honestly, Nick, it was... Uh, and we had a gig. We had a show that night. So... Crazy. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it's such a hard thing to digest. You, uh, As someone listening to the story, you try and put yourself in those shoes, in your shoes, and you can't imagine what it's like. I didn't want to be in um, those shoes that evening. Again, just to re-emphasize, uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm flogging a dead horse with this, but it's your first world tour. None of this comes with the handbook, but whoa. I mean, these were, whew, these were cartoon head-shaking moments. Did you ever get an explanation for this, ever? No. It just seems like such a weird, controlling thing and as a listener and again we've had this conversation many times but still as someone listening to the anecdote and not living it it's very hard to understand what actually went on and what was going through people's minds back then I mean I was I was humiliated I just I felt like all these eyes were upon me and that's pretty much exactly how it happened. And right after the speech, you know, start the music, and now we've got a stripper coming out. And, I mean, it was so surreal. <laughs> it it sounds know, like it something I would like, write. Yeah, exactly. It's like being in a Fellini well, We call it fiction something. for a reason, folks. So, showtime. You know, we've got a show in a few hours. I have all of this, obviously fresh in my mind as we're getting ready to start a show so crazy as if that weren't yeah. enough then you have to commit yourself to a couple of hours of of performance yeah how do you deal with that how do you deal with that on a on a on a purely mental and emotional level how do you deal with that the show must go on what was i going to do so you so you shove it to the back of your mind and you're professional and you yeah. you get up and you do your you job. S- you steamroll through it. The show goes on. And we're performing along, everything is fine until we get to paradise. And then things went off script. So we start paradise. I think we had already done stop right there and all of that. I think I was already out of the dress. I'm not sure, but I believe I was. But at one point, he's, at that point, whenever it was, he stops the band. Stops the band, comes walking over to stage right where I am and just starts making some comments about what I'm wearing and then grabs the wig, takes the wig, off of my head. He just pulls it off of my head. Because you're wearing like a short blonde wig at this point, right? Yeah, I'm wearing the, the blonde wig. And he just rips the wig off my head, makes a comment about the wig, just flings it in my face and says, eat this. Didn't know what the hell to do there. Well, no, I did know what to do there, but I was in shock. I was in shock with that. It really it was definitely off script. This is, we've never rehearsed this. At that point, I think... I went into like Sicilian, the Sicilian part of me just went into overdrive. And I basically picked up the wig and stuck it between my legs and on the mic. And I was like, 
Oh yeah, eat this. <laughs> <laughs> And the crowd went crazy. Nuts. It was nuts. It was cr- crazy. I looked behind me. I, I'll never forget Steve Buslow's face because I was on his side of the stage. And his eyes, his jaw, boom, to the floor. And it, it, it was, someone had to have taped this evening. This was at the Sydney State Theater. If someone has a copy of that show. Just Sydney that State Theater. Parents. Australia, end of 93. Um, We'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. Even just that moment. I'll take care of all the transfer of the the, uh, the recording into a format I can see. Or we could do it probably, uh, uh, hello, modern technology. There you go. If you do have a copy of that show or even that moment during Paradise by the Dashboard Light, leave us a comment and we'll get back to you. And hopefully we can find Patty's yeah, wig yeah. moment. I still have that wig, actually. <laughs> I do. I still have that wig. Yeah. So uh, that's how we ended Paradise. And I have to be honest, at the end of that show, I wanted to go home. I was done. I mean, I went. I was beside myself. I remember going up into the dressing rooms, going into the band's dressing room, and just having a bit of a meltdown and I was like where's it where's his dressing room where's where's meat's dressing room I go this is ridiculous I go what the hell I'm I'm, I'm done with this shit I am totally done and Steve is like holding me back and he's like no 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 calm down calm down I go this is this none of this I, I didn't sign up for this and there's obviously a lot of other more colorful words that I won't get into but it was uh, I, I was done I was done Certain band members were kind of just trying to talk me off the cliff and just just stick around, you know, this this will pass. But it was just the, the whole thing was just, was not a pleasant experience at all. It, when you hear stories like that, it's hard for someone on the outside, I think, who's perhaps hearing this for the first time to equate it with the videos. Uh, I lived it. The, exactly. How do you think I felt? You know, you said being in my shoes. I don't want to be in those shoes. As this was around Halloween. The promoter, we had a day off or whatever, and the promoter had set, uh, had rented this large boat, yacht, and threw a party, threw a Halloween party on the boat as we toured around Sydney Harbor. And I was like, no, I'm out. I'm not going to this thing. I'm not going. Didn't want to go. Didn't want to go. And I was talked into it from one of the band members. And I was like, how, how do you expect, how can you expect me to, to, I, I, the last thing I wanted to do was be on a boat partying. And I, I just was, I was done. I, uh, I went, I got a fucking costume. We went to a costume place. I ended up getting of all things, a koala bear, which was fine because I, it was a headpiece and you basically wouldn't even know who was under there. Went on the boat and it was, uh, it wasn't pleasant. There were a lot of tears, a lot of hurt behind that costume, underneath that costume. Understandably so, I think, to anyone listening. What a, what a crazy situation to be in. Yeah. And adding insult to injury. The wardrobe person's boyfriend is also on the boat in costume. And everything is fine and dandy. And unbelievable. I am there alone. Yeah, it sucked. It really sucked. But uh, So I've got to ask you, and I think people would be curious, how was Meatloaf up until that point? I mean, what was your relationship like with him uh, up until up until this point when he when he did this? I'm the new kid on the block here. I'm, I'm processing a lot of a lot of things, and I don't want to upset the apple cart. The interaction with him, I mean, other than doing shows prior to that and being performing on stage, it's a new relationship. It's um, you need time to get comfortable, I guess, with people. 
I kept my distance, smiled, and did what I was told. But uh, I was just the whole that whole that whole experience was was crazy. I mean, and an explanation given that I needed to hang with the band and focus on the music and uh, it was crazy. It was not it was not pleasant. What what a shame. What a shame because that's a huge monumental moment in my in my life. This is my first my first tour ever in the big leagues. And you can't get much bigger than that when you're touring your first tour being a, a number one song that is number one in God knows how many countries, dozens of countries. And this was just a, a big kind of black eye in the, in, in the midst of all of that memory. Obviously, I moved on. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been there for as long as I was. But for a moment there, it was really it was really touch and go for you, wasn't it? Whether you would actually stay after those things happened. Oh, yeah. You, you yeah, gave yeah, it yeah. serious, serious thought and came so close to throwing the towel in. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted out. I was like, I'm, no, this isn't for me. So where do you go from here? What happens afterwards? Do you, what happens with your boyfriend? Well, eventually, I mean, he stuck around uh, for a while. I sat with somebody on the flight that uh, lived in Melbourne and uh, had a huge uh, farm and had invited us over for dinner. So uh, he rented a car. Oh, son of a bitch, driving, sitting in the other side and, and driving stick. It was like, and we went to these people's house for dinner. Uh, lovely, lovely people. You know, they ended up, I got them tickets to, to a show in Melbourne. And I also have family that live there. Um, I have relatives there. So uh, on these off days in Melbourne, we went to uh, we went to visit the family, and uh, you know, and then, then eventually he, uh, you know, he flew back. And you finish the tour, you take a break. Yeah. And you're about to write and record an album, and I think that's where we'll pick up next time. Right. And that would be the recording sessions for Welcome to the Neighborhood, 1995's Welcome to the Neighborhood. Right. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And there's also another little tidbit, as I'll leave a cliffhanger on that, because there was another album that was created. I think we will start the show next time with... A little discussion about the album that could have been Welcome to the Neighborhood. The album that could have been. Yeah. Which probably would have set history off in a slightly different course. Uh, I've heard this album and it's phenomenal. And that's all I can say. If yeah. this would have happened, it would have been like, it would have been, as you so aptly said, Meatloaf's Tommy by The Who. This would have been his concept album. Um, which to me was really where I, as a kid, as a teenager, really where I was expecting things to go after after Bat 2, because it was so visual and it the songs had so much narrative to them. I expected more of that heightened fairy tale world, but with this kind of urban realism to it. You know, I still to this day listen to that, uh, but we'll go, we'll leave that We'll leave that for the next one. So there you go. You've been on tour through the highs, through the lows, the trial by fire. And you're about to go into the recording studio with Meat and the band for the first time, which is where we'll pick up next time. So signing off. All the best to everyone out there and uh, ovaries and out. Stay safe, folks. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.